I like a, there was a blue hospital, but I don't know if that was my direction. <laughs> uh, that yeah, might have been quite a different in our days than it is today. Yeah, was. I think I mixed up the Smurf kit with the hospital. <laughs> kit. Um, yeah, I just, I just, I'm in hospital, and then I remember just really enjoying making the little men sit down flat. <laughs> that was very interesting to me. Um, yes. um, what role do you think that creativity during your childhood has played in your future success as an artist? Um, I think that, I mean, I'm really lucky in, in the fact that what I do in, in, my, in my day job is like continuously accessing like a spirit. There has to be the spirit of joy in creation, you know, when I sit in a room with somebody for the first time or the hundredth time we sit down to write a song, if there's not that spark of playfulness from the beginning, that feeling of joy, then the song is, or whatever we make is going to sound labored or whatever it is. So it's it's very important like that that playfulness like has to be in the in the initial inspiration of most of the stuff that I do. And in addition to obviously having a really creative career yourself, you've worked with lots of incredible names across in music. Um, how do you think um, you know from those collaborations that creativity can help nurture talent? I in what I do cre creativity is is really the key and the groundwork of everything. And that doesn't mean like, say a song like Uptown Funk, like the way that it came about was this very joyous jam session of seven hours of just playing the same thing over and over again, and then cut to like seven months of sitting in front of a computer laboring over like a hi-hat sound. Like of course mm -hmm. there's a lot of work that goes into it to get things to the finish line, but if it doesn't come, that thing of creativity and, and that shared, that room and that environment, if it doesn't come from that thing originally, Thank you. Um, David, um, you're wearing this incredible contraption. Can you tell us a bit about it? Well, uh, this is my, my this is actually my second prosthetic arm. The one that I built with nine years old uh, was destroyed because I usually destroyed everything that I built to build my own things. And this happened as well uh, with this prosthetic. I destroyed the helicopter that uh, in the box. <laughs> and I'll destroy this mantle and build a, a prosthetic in, in a week. Wow, that's incredible. Um, how, could you tell us how you went about creating this thing and what inspired it? Uh, it was actually a very quick thought about doing something different uh, from the uh, usual car or the plane that I have in my room. And I, can, I could do this because I played a, a lot with Legos when I was a child. And as it helped me a lot, um, forgetting about the world that I was living because uh, I was bullied a little bit when I was a kid. And this helped me uh, forget everything that uh, was wrong in my head. And when I was making something different and I, was, uh, I showed my, par my parents, uh, they were astonished. And this was actually the greatest thing I have ever done because it not only it showed uh, what you can do with Lego, but I uh, learned that I can help other people with uh, a toy like uh, like this one, and I think it's amazing. That's incredible. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Um, I know you went on to kind of study robotics. Is that correct? I'm studying bioengineering. You're studying bioengineering. And how has um, you playing with Lego and developing this product helped inform your potential your future career? I'm studying my second year now. I think uh, 3D printing comes to the third year. But as my career goes on, I'm trained to design new prosthetics. And my goal building prosthetics was only using one set of Lego. And that's what I did. Uh, the last model, but now I'm thinking to build something with uh, two, maybe three, five different sets in order to make like the greatest prosthetic ever. Because every time I make a prosthetic, I try to go like the extra mile and do something different. And I think it's like music, but not spending seven months <laughs> uh, building a prosthetic because I'm, I'm actually uh, nervous on some things. And building this is actually a thing that I enjoy a lot. So, yeah. Thank you.
It sounds like there's already some overlaps developing in the ways in which kind of Lego has informed your your, your creativity and your careers. So it'd be interesting to explore those in a moment. Um, Inka, um, you're also a maker, um, and I know that you played with Lego as a child. Could you tell us a bit about your memories of that? Um, what did you make and what was memorable for you? Yeah, for me, because I grew up in a household, I had two, or one sister, two, three brothers. So my sister was always kind of, you know, the, very annoying as a, as a <laughs> So I was always trying to make objects that were quite scary, like a, a lizard or a tiger or something that would sort of get away from me. Um, so, yeah, I always made objects that were not as, not the most friendly as my little sister. You know. um, I, love, I love making chairs as well, little objects that I could kind of, you know, touch scrolls with. So I enjoyed making objects that sort of had personal kind of value and meaning behind them. So you were already making chairs with Lego? Yeah, as yeah. Well. Which has become my, my, my career now, so I love just kind of using objects, kind of tell stories, um, and you know, uh, just yeah, in a way you can kind of connect with this, this <laughs> right, so, yeah. I mean, one characteristic of your work is it's the use of colour yeah. in a very playful way. Yeah. How would you say that playing as a child has informed the aesthetic that you use in your work? I mean, that's because I grew up in North London in a small council estate. Um, I remember in my playground we had this kind of small kind of swing and seesaw and that kind of thing. Um, and what's, what I try and do is what I try and reimagine these spaces that I, as a child, um, but as an adult now. So I, sort of, I'm, I still kind of think I'm a kid when I'm designing because I love playing with objects and installations and buildings. Um, so Lego is again really popular because it has so many colours and colour for me is about memory. So using those kind of Lego you know, colours and objects, I can reimagine my memory as a, ch as a child and as an adult. So that's quite powerful with Lego and, and the colours it has. So. Um, why do you, I mean, we talked about play in the context of being a child, but is play also important to adults? Yeah, I think, yeah, totally. I think when you're an adult, you're kind of told to be very kind of serious and sort of one, you sort of have to be a certain way. But when you're a child, you can kind of, you can imagine anything and dream, and that's how being a, a, a child, you can dream about anything. Um, when I was, I thought when I went to university, I was kind of told to work a certain way, design a certain way, you can't be, you know, you can't, think crazy because this is the kind of curriculum for me to kind of follow. Um, but now I'm sort of it has my own studio, I can kind of create any I can dream about anything and make it in my studio, which is the power of you know being a designer and a creative. Um, so yeah that's for me why I, why I think it's missing and I think in, in adult kind of you know life we're very we're very rigid, we're not actually as creative as we should be when we're you know a child. So, yeah but definitely it's missing. Really interesting. I'd be interested to hear some of you guys' thoughts on being creative as adults shortly. Um, Matthew, what, what is it about Lego that's captured the imaginations of so many children and adults for so long, as somebody who's developed this product for mm. a long time? I think um, one of the main things is probably sort of how open-ended it is, and you can put just endless possibilities for whatever you can make from Lego. So you can put a pile of bricks in front of one child, and they'll see a car or a spaceship or something. If it's another child, it will be something completely different. And then put it in, um, um, if, if David, um, somebody like David, who is so inspiring and brilliant, just saw this helicopter, saw all of these bits and pieces, and decided I'm going to use this to, to sort of help his life and, and improve some of the problems that he's been having. And I think that that's really inspiring. You can't get that from any other toy. So I think the, the sort of system in play is really important. I was wondering what you think about the fact that in a digital age, you know, um, some people think that uh, making things doesn't play as big a role. Do you think that the digital world is stifling creativity or do you think it's a positive thing? I think it's a real balance. I think there's some amazing sort of apps and digital experiences out there that really help push kids' creativity. And, and build their confidence as well. And that's something that we're, we're wanting to get behind as well. So we've got a lot of um, things where we're trying to marry digital experiences and sort of Lego building it together. Um, we've got like a boost set that we've launched where you can code and program robots. And um, there's so many different experiences that we're working on. And I think both can work hand in hand. Um, but I do think making things physically is something that's incredibly important. And I think it also instills a real sort of sense of pride in children as well. If they've had something in their imagination and they've figured out how to put it together 
um, then, then having something physical and tangible is, is something that's really rewarding and something that they can show off to their parents and friends what they've created as well. Yeah, definitely. And the Lego brick celebrated <coughs> 60 yes, years this exactly. year, which is incredible. Yes. Many toys don't have that kind of longevity. <laughs> What is it about the Lego brick, do you think, that has lasted so long? Well, I think the fact that it is a system in play in those bricks that were made 60 years ago that parents may have in their attics fit together perfectly with bricks that are made today for kids. And it's sort of a cross-generational um, um, sort of activity that, that so many parents and grandparents have enjoyed and want to pass that on to to kids and I think what we've tried to do as well is sort of evolve with time, make sure that we're really current and relevant um, so we can really introduce um, new sort of sets and building opportunities and experiences for kids that really sort of hit on their passions of today and I think that's been, been really important. So it's, it's moving with the times but also staying true to, to who we are in our system in place. Yeah, it makes complete sense. I mean, one of the things we're here to talk about um, is and the role of creativity in education and in nurturing the talent of the next generation. Um, and Kate, I was wondering in your experience as an educator, what role do you think creativity plays and how can education be enhanced by creativity? Um, I think it plays every role. You know, the, a lot of the challenges or the changes that are happening in the world at the moment, you know, every generation has faced changes, you know, as they're developing. Um, but we're in, we're in a time when they're so unique never experienced a digital revolution before um, and it's the generation of kids who are in school now or in university or graduating who will it will fall to them to really own the new world that's being created um, and that being the case we can't teach them how to how to do that through old methods such as rope learning you, know, you can't teach swimming in a locker room you have to kind of get in the water so um, yeah I, I think it plays every role in education so would you be able to give us some examples of like how creativity can help children learn? Yeah. Um, I, the, the wonderful thing at the moment, I find it very encouraging, is that the movement to make education or embrace creativity more in education is really catching fire. And so that it's happening already every single day in schools and classrooms with parents and teachers and kids are, are asking for it. Um, so there are amazing examples out there that are happening already every single day. but. Um, you know, there are examples such as flip learning where you can learn everything at home and then come and use the classroom time to talk to teachers and that's an amazing time to encourage creativity because you're not so stressed about rote learning or about memorising or getting the right answer, which is hugely important when it comes to creativity, um, that, you, that there's space to, to rethink or space to try again. Um, and, you know, there, there are lots of like passion-based learning is a really big one that's coming where you look at how children what they're interested in and then you scaffold that learning um, and, and from it you know they're learning all sorts of skills that, that don't you know that go so much further than just a test taker that's really interesting and of course we're in an era where creative educa education is facing a lot of challenges mm -hmm. um, you know having a creative education is becoming more extensive in a formal sense yeah. um, and it's often perceived to not lead to like a proper job um, what do you think, as an educator, that, that the role of creativity is in the face of such arguments? Um, I'm not sure there is such a thing as a proper job anymore, um, or what that ever meant, really. Um, <laughs> what a relief, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have an answer when people ask me what I do. Um, well, so there are a few things. First of all, obviously, that's a wrong conception. Um, and there are some misconceptions along with that, like what creativity is, that it's only for certain people or for certain pursuits. Whereas you can be creative in every type of education. Um, and, and one thing that I think is important to say is that while you know, certainly one role of education is to help young people develop so that when they do go into labor market or into labor life that they're ready for it, but um, they're also alive right now. You know? And so there's a huge, you don't wait in the wings and go on stage when you're 18. Um, and there's a huge amount of benefits that are here and now for young people with creativity, such as, you know, I finding out about themselves, trying on new versions of themselves, and confidence, collaboration. Um, so, yeah, so there's, I think you know, there's the whole idea that there's a proper job and after that is, is wrong, but then also the thought that you have to wait until you're 18 or in a proper job to make use, and that's the only reason that we're doing it, um, is, also, is also wrong. And also then how, you know, what's perceived as a creative education. If you're a teacher or a student or a parent, you are the system. 
So if you change what you're doing, then you know, naturally the system changes. Um, so you're right, you know, if you're, if you're into a formal creative education, but there are all sorts of methods now that are picking up speed, like unschooling or homeschooling, which thanks to technology, um, and I, and I think I, that was one of the things that I struggled, struggled through as a child as well, is that I had some people that were really supportive and could sort of see the talent that I had. And then through schooling and relatives and things, that there was several people that were like, oh, you're never going to get a proper job for a cartoon character. And just focus on the academic side of things. And I think it's so important, important that we can find a way to sort of nurture children's creativity and give them the space because they're so brilliant in themselves. When you're little, you're so curious and so imaginative, so creative, so daring. And as you sort of go through life, all of these things get knocked away from you a little bit and and you have to conform and you have to behave like a grown up and yeah. and and you sort of blink yourself to the possibilities of, of what things could be. And I think it's 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 so important that we find ways to, to give kids the, the space and the skills and the confidence to go out and, and do whatever they can do. What I was saying when I was uh, sort of doing my degree in French design and product design, my parents were like, I'm Nigerian, so you've got to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> that was the standard law my house. And we were like, you're a doctor, you're an engineer. <laughs> um, and I refused, I said, I'm going to be a French designer. And they came to my graduate show, and they were like, oh, OK, you're picking at the table. If you're <laughs> and they were like, you can be a designer, yeah. Right. So, I don't know, it's quite hard to sort of see talent in the beginning, but I think when you can make something, I think then it, it feels like you're inspired and you're going to trust that you can be something creative. But, yeah, my parents were not all for it in the beginning. Are they convinced now? They are, yeah, yeah. yeah. What was the turning point? I think the pavilion that they were in, in Dulwich that they'd seen, and um, I mean, they still didn't get what I do now, anyway. They'd come to all my exhibitions and they're like, so what's, what's brilliant? What's, what's this? And, and a chair, but that's not functional. Uh, yeah. So that's the Dulwich Pavilion, of yeah. course, which is in line with summer. And yeah. um, Mark, did you face any resistance to wanting to pursue a creative career? Um, well, I was sort of lucky. I mean, I had one side of my family that was really conservative, and then my mom, my dad split. My mom married a, a musician. But when I started up, actually, I was like DJing in in hip hop clubs in New York. And this is like 25 years ago when DJing wasn't just like something that every like it person did, like people didn't really understand it. So the weird thing was like my stepdad, who's like a rock, rock and roll star, is like, is going like, well, when are you gonna go back to playing the guitar and being a real rock and roll star instead of this DJing thing? Like it was like a little bit of not quite like, when are you gonna be an account, but when are you gonna go back to, like, trying to be Slash, yeah. Um, but um, no, I was I was I was pretty lucky that I, my stepdad had music equipment around the house, and I would get to make my demos, and he was encouraged. And you know, as long as I did all right in school, my marks were okay. So. No, that's interesting. And how did you find space to be creative when you were when you were younger? My space for being creative was my room. It was yeah. like uh, this bubble when every idea that came to my mind that came to my mind uh, was built in Lego even if it was uh, I'm afraid to, to, to say this but it, um, I usually built a lot of guns when I was a child <laughs> not because I, I was violent because I'm not violent in, uh, at all but uh, I like how the, the mechanics work inside so I try to make them with to make them with Lego and I have uh, some rifles that should rubber bands and that's a really fun thing. But my room. And then, how did you get on to designing? Ah, uh, yeah. The prosthetics. Uh, I never thought that I, I could do this, but I showed myself that uh, anything is possible if you believe in it. Because when I was nine, I never thought about building a prosthetic. I was building a boat, but I decided to put it on my arm, just because it looked cool in my arm. And then I decided to close it to put some uh, duct tape and make like a, a fingers with Lego Bionicles that closes, uh, that uh, closed when I did this movement with my arm, with my residual arm that's inside here. So with this movement, yeah. the arm closed. And that's the same movement I use for different uh, systems in my prosthetics. So this wasn't a desi uh, before designing 
on a table or drawing something, it just came to my mind and as everything I did with Legos, it's like uh, if I'm doing this, I forget about the, uh, the outside and I can express myself. This is like art, I consider this art, in my opinion. Yeah, it is. Because it's your mind uh, in a mechanical way. It's like a, a way to understand your mind. I'd be interested to know if you guys agree that play or creativity is a form of art in itself. Do you think that's the case, or do you think art is about the end product? And how important is play to your creative process? I think play is really important, and as Julia mentioned before, um, through playing you can learn so many different things that can build your creative confidence, it can help you solve problems, it can teach you to communicate and things. So, so there's, there's so much more to play than, than many people think. And I think that's one of the things it's kind of down prioritized in the world at the moment as well, that it's like, oh, play is the silly stuff, the homework first, getting a few, the grades at school and everything is, is sort of more of the, the focus. And I think um, we kind of need as a society to, to sort of acknowledge how important it is and that, that kids can actually develop so much more through play than, than people currently think they can. I mean, how do you think we could make more space for children to play and be creative when they're growing up? Um, I, I think a big one is to allow them, you know, you don't, you don't have to tell them to play. You can't, you know, and, and actually there's evidence proof that if you do force them to play them, they don't go into a state of play where they're, um, getting more benefits such as cognitive development or socio-emotional development. Um, so it's about it's about allowing them allowing them the time to do it. You know, they're not over scheduling themselves. They're that's what they go to if they have a spare minute. So it's about letting them do it and, and trusting that um, well, trusting them. And trusting that by doing it they're not missing out on this, that, and the other, but actually they're experiencing something that, you know, is joy for joy's sake, but also has all the other benefits that, you know, rest, racing them off to SAT tutoring or whatever it is yeah. going to. I know, because I've got a niece who's two and she's in the table twos when you're running around and stuff. So she thinks she's just running around the whole house and breaking everything. I'm like, stop running around. <laughs> and I feel guilty because like, this is what we're here to you know, go play. So I feel like I just, just love playing. And I just, yeah, because she's growing and developing and learning how to play, you know, with like different imagination and things that she wants to be in touch and, and, and build with. So um, I think it's just about kind of encouraging young kids to play a lot more and not sort of limiting their play or how they play. So that's part of their growth as well, you know, so just about encouraging. You know. There's some great cause and effect with that as well. Yeah. If you smash into something and it all yeah. falls off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's always a great lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone <laughs> that breaks, there's but always it, an explanation. Yeah, it is how they learn boundaries and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and, and what happens if you do that. So. And that's why Lego is the perfect tool for that, exactly. because you can build something, break it apart and rebuild it into yeah. whatever you want. So. Um, I think that's what, what really makes this different and, and why this campaign is so important to us as well. Do you think, um, people are talking about breaking things and, you know, children knocking things over, do you think, like, part of creativity is, like, making mistakes and things yeah. going wrong? Yeah. Is that an important part of creativity? Yeah, I mean, I think most of the things, and just back to what you are saying before, I mean, I guess I'm sort of lucky, like, my job is, like, I mean, you call it literally playing an instrument. <laughs> DJ, you're playing records. Know, so there's obviously a lot of play and what you're saying is the art, the creation of the end product. I think most people need to see an end product to actually know what you what you did and to call it art. I, but for me, the, the thing that brings the most joy is the actual creation, the process of it, not, not the end point. Because if you told me like, hey, you know, at the beginning of going to the studio, you're going to make a song that sounds exactly like this. Well, then it might not be as much fun to like then get to the end of the thing, whereas the, the, the actual, it's the, it's the process of what happens in the time that you take. And I can't remember what your question was. <laughs> it's interesting that your, because your process involves an element of play, like yes. you're playing an instrument, but it, like if you think about a song like Uptown Funk, it makes you want to play too, right? Right, yeah. So you want to inspire others to play. Yeah, that's the best thing. Like I get tagged all the time, just like in videos of like, somebody with their two-year-old dances that song. I mean, like, I just have to say, like, uh, four years ago, it got to the point where, like, my friends would call me and be like, if my kid asked to hear that song one more time, I'm getting to <laughs> Like, it became a children's song, and that's, like, the greatest thing ever. And now some of those kids are, were, like, five or six when that song came out, maybe they were two, and, like, it's, it's, it's 
wonderful to make something that like brings joy to people, definitely. Yeah, it was definitely a really playful song. Yeah. So it shows that like toys are playful and creative, but other creative mediums can be playful as well. And I, I think that what you were saying about sort of making mistakes is is so important um, for everybody to go through that. And I'm still dealing with that with the products that I develop today. You don't necessarily hit the nail on the head every time, but um, what you do do is you sort of learn by your mistakes and figure out how to improve things um, moving forward as well. So I think um, if, if nobody made any mistakes or didn't experiment, then, then the, the world would be, be stuck in one place. So I think it's, it's, it's all part of the creative process and, and should be encouraged in a way. I mean, it's part, of every, yeah, it's all part of every process as well. It's again, it's that misconception that creativity is just about the arts or about certain subjects or activities, but in any field, in mathematics or in science or in any field, you know, we didn't get to the final product on the first attempt. And David, how, how many attempts did you make yeah. before you got to that one? Um, I think I took, it took um, a week of trying to build the best fit for my arm mm -hmm. because um, we are humans, we're not perfect, and Lego moves in a very symmetrical way, so I had to adapt my arm to the prosthetic and vice versa. So I will explain you the mechanism, actually. You see this uh, little gear here that turns? And that was actually the last part I built because I, I was trying not to pressure my arm too much when I was building it. Um, you see this piston here? That was actually a piston that uh, retracted the gear from the helicopter. And I decided to build a mechanism that closes my arm inside the prosthetic so you cannot steal it. And uh, it doesn't fall off if I do this or I push it away. And it may hurt, but it's the safest way to, it was the safest way to build the prosthetic in that moment. Now I have more sophisticated ones and they move faster. I mean, faster than this actually. And they don't hurt. So, it's like the process of being creative and thinking about new ways to build a prosthetic. Uh, I actually have a pre-designed model for the bracelet. I will show you the insides and you will see that some bricks may hurt my arm and my arm as well. It's kind of pressurized in there, but this is because this was the first model. The third and the second and the third one are in that uh, um, punishment for my arm, let's say. <laughs> see? Um, there's a lot of bricks inside, they don't follow a pattern. It's like the most, uh, you, you see here in the entropy of, uh, of the system, it's like, the prosthetic is like uh, a very uh, cool disorder. So my other prosthetics, uh, I think they're not that cool, but they are um, built in the way that it fits better my arm. So I think this one's the coolest because it was the first one with Lego technique, but as well, it's a more, uh, it's the one that hurts my arm. <laughs> 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 Do you mind if we ask how old you were when you made that one? The, the uh, first uh, prototype. This is uh, two years old, so I built it when I was okay. 18. And the, go the cool thing is that I spent more time building this one than the newest ones. I, be I built one in two days, and that was the second one. I built the third one in 10 hours, okay. and the fourth one, let, let's make a guess. Uh, <laughs> I, I made it in nine hours. So it's like I'm keeping to, I'm not trying to go faster, but I'm, I'm trying to, uh, as I have a model already for the arm and how I want to build it even before I'm doing the prosthetic, um, now, that, now that I have more experience, um, it's the fun part. As Mark said, doing the song is actually the fun part, listening to it. It may be cool when you master it and everything, but you can never feel the process again because the song is finished. I mean, you can play it. You can play it, yeah, again in your studio. But you cannot um, have the joy to play it again for the first time. Before we wrap up, I'd love to. I mean, I think we know. I, I wanted to ask a question really to the panel. I think we know your answer, David. But it's it was basically um, since we're talking about rebuilding the world. I wondered if you could rebuild the world in Lego, what you would build. Um, I don't know whether, Matthew, since you work with Lego all the time, <laughs> yeah. you might do that well. Can I say something? <laughs> I will rebuild the mind of you the people. Will, okay. You would what, sorry? Rebuild minds. 
rebuild minds. Minds. It helps from people. That would be incredible. That's the first thing I think it's the best, the most important thing to change in in our society. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I don't know what to say after that. One. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, but I, I think as well. Um, if I could make the world the way I wanted it, I'd probably put kids much more in charge than they are at the moment. And if we could learn a lot from them and use them as our role models as well, I think throughout life, if you asked the majority of adults now, do you see yourself as creative? Most of them would probably say no, and that's a real shame. That, that And they probably all, are all doing little creative things in their life. Um, every single day without realizing, even if it's just trying to figure out how to trick your child to taking some vegetables or something, there's creative processes going on there. So I think um, that it's, I'd, I'd really like us to find a way as a society to sort of encourage creativity, not let kids um, lose that so adults can be just as, as creative and as passionate as kids. So that is what I would like my world to be like. Nice. <clears throat> Any more ideas from the floor? I love colour, so as you, as you know in my work, I would probably uh, sort of build like colourful cities and like colourful houses and just add more colour into, yeah. into the world, which we need to do that. Particularly on a rainy day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It makes you feel more happier, um, just a lot more positive than the grey villages that you see. Yeah, just building more kind of colourful houses yeah, around us. Just colourful Lego it's, house definitely yeah. helps you know, <laughs> on a day like this, doesn't it? Um, Mark, if, what would you build? Uh, well, I can't beat minds or kids or colors. So, um, I think that, I mean, actually just walking around here for the first time, just so amazed at all the things that you can like build out of Lego, actually. So, I just maybe just a, another big dinosaur would be great. Can't beat They're gone, actually. <laughs> I was going to say I would build. Um, the upside down from Stranger Things, and then I found out that they go actually pump out. Yeah. So I'm going to be checking that out later. Um, it's in the shop. <laughs> you know where to find me. <laughs> well, thank you so much to our panel um, for such a fruitful discussion. It would be great to take some questions from the floor. Um, we haven't heard from you guys yet, so now's your chance. Could we have a show of hands? Does anyone like to ask a panel question? Yeah. <laughs> a question about the campaign or else about their experiences of play. Uh, it's just the, um, uh, the, the tagline with Build the World. Um, I mean, it was very interesting the, the answers you gave to that. Um, and I think we probably mostly agree with it. But, but we build the world. It, it does seem almost uh, supposed to be destructive um, uh, for, for a, a Lego phrase. Is, is, is there the sense that there, 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 there's something fundamentally wrong with the world? In, I think kids have a really sort of positive outlook on the world and what we want to do with that this campaign is just sort of spark their imagination and fuel that. So um, to, to, to keep them going and keep becoming even more creative and potentially if that helps make the world a better place in the long run and I'm sure it, it will do through making things more fun and more caring and more imaginative and all of those things, I, I think it's, 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 only, it's only positive. So I think that there is a really nice message within this and it's sort of, the campaign in itself is looking at the world through kids' eyes and all of that wonder that we, we may lose as adults and, and, and sort of try and hold on to that and, and make things as, as great as they can be. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's also the message that creativity is becoming even more important and mm -hmm. that future careers will be defined by creativity yeah. according to some of the statistics we heard in the introduction. Yeah. Um, so I think part of the reason for the campaign is a recentering of the way we learn yeah. on the back of that. Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to take some more questions if anyone would be willing to put themselves forward. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I work in China where for thousands of years the education and the political hierarchy has about conform has been about conformity and obedience. Mm -hmm. um, and 
even now, uh, you know, you still see that working to some degree. So when we try to rebuild the world or see the world through kids' eyes and perhaps have more individuality, have less of that groupthink mentality, do you think the outcomes would be all positive? That's an interesting question. Do you really think what the children would imagine in Crate would all be positive or their responses to it? Uh, how the system would work in the world's most populous nation. Sure. I think it wouldn't be easy. Um, you know, systems, such as particular education systems, are human systems, and any time you try and change a human system, you're not dealing with Lego bricks, you're dealing with people. Um, and certainly the risk is great when it comes to education because you know, you're, you're dealing with people's real lives. Um, but it's certainly, I would say, that that the, the outcome could, you know, could only be positive. I guess I'd ask you the question as well. Do you think it could, is, could it possibly be a bad thing? I can't envisage how it could be. Um, well, I guess in big cities with well-educated um, you know, people earning good incomes, it seems that creativity and individuality can pay off. But then that is built on the back of uh, the masses, if you like, having mundane and lower paying jobs and almost being happy with that lot. And I wonder, you know, around the world, do you see huge populations where everyone is as, you know, respected individually as, say, in Scandinavian countries, which always held up as the benchmark for, you know, mm -hmm. respecting individuals? Yeah. I think also the, it's the fact that, you know, the world is changing. What we may be happy with today may not be what's driving the world in 30, 50 years' time. So I think the point of this campaign is trying to plan for that future now. And that's by nurturing children with skills that they will need. And given the fact that you know automation is on the rise, the way that things are made, the way the world is run is changing, we're, li we're going to be living in a much more technologically advanced world. Um, and therefore, I think the value of creativity in having an individual idea will be, have much more worth um, than we can possibly imagine now. You can understand why there's so much fear um, in a large nation like China. Mm -hmm. I, um, I ran a project a few years ago looking at the future of education for Finland. And I was in Singapore interviewing education thought leaders and what they thought the future of education would look like. And I was used to hearing answers you know, about interactive whiteboards and personalised learning. And I interviewed a woman from Bangladesh who said, we need more classrooms and teachers feel safe coming to work. And so certainly when you're looking at math systems in the world that we live in, the starting point isn't the same for everybody. Um, and one of the questions that, that we had at the time was, is there a linear route that everybody has to take? Or are those places in, in a position where you know, they can start building a fraction and a new in a new way from, from the onset. Um, so 100% in, in the world that we live in, it's not, it's not linear, but then nothing, nothing is. And like, yeah, you're, you're doing a few slides, but I would argue that um, you know, there's enough sufficient evidence that the system as it is, is failing more than, than any pr prospective system would. I think it's time to wrap up now. Thank you for the really thought-provoking questions. I think we could have they got a whole lot of panel discussion bits on those, so thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us. That wraps up today's panel. Um, yeah, there'll be more happening across the day, I think you're all informed. But thank you so much for joining us.